Hey, I'm Mia Hemstad. I'm a wife, I'm a mom of two kids, and I'm a trauma-informed self-care coach. I also live with diagnosed PTSD and depression. I started sharing my mental wellness journey online in 2017 when I was diagnosed with postpartum depression and anxiety. And since then, I've heard from hundreds of women who all struggle with the same thing, putting ourselves last. This is a struggle that's keeping so many women burned out and unhappy, through no fault of our own, by the way. I've been working on my own healing as an abuse survivor since 2013. But when I became a mom, I really started to do the inner work of figuring out why I was putting myself last and how to start prioritizing myself for the first time in my life. This podcast is about sharing all of those lessons with you. So if you're interested in hearing honest stories, life advice, and inspiration that encourages you to make your health, happiness, and well-being a priority, then definitely stick around. Welcome to your No Longer Last journey. Hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be back today. I I have been way overthinking making this podcast episode because I want it to be perfect and I'm a recovering perfectionist and I have been really struggling with the resurrection of perfectionism and overthinking recently and it's been challenging so I feel super proud to just be doing it and talking about what I want to talk about today. You probably already know from the title of this episode that I went and I saw Beyonce live in concert. I can't believe I'm saying that out loud. My uh, cheeks are reaching my eyeballs for those of you who are listening and you're not watching the video version of this. Um, Just talking about it still makes me so happy. Um, It happened about two weeks ago and yeah, it was, you know, I talked to a few of my friends about it because I really wanted to go with somebody and nobody was available. And I really was like, you know what? It's just not for like, it's not my year. It's not my time. Like no one's available. Money is tight, you know, and you know, I was at, it was funny. I was actually at a staff meeting with my coworkers and they were talking about Beyonce, how she's on tour for the first time in like seven years or, or what have you. I can't remember how many years it is. And like, how expensive the tickets are. And I was just like, and they were like, oh yeah, we hear that she's going to be touring Europe first. Mia, are you going to go since you live in Europe? And I was just like, no, I haven't even looked at tickets. I'm not planning on going, but none of my friends can go. You know, I just totally cleared it off my, you know, just was like, this is not possible for me. And I'm really, really trying to keep working against that trauma-based response that I have where I tell myself no before I've even looked into it. And this is something that I encourage all of you to do because so many of us, we were told no a lot as children and we never really got to fulfill any of our desires or even some of our needs. Um, it's very easy for us to continue that harmful pattern of telling ourselves no all the time and, and letting ourselves down and our, letting ourselves be just unfulfilled in life. And it's like, I just want to take my power back and I want to practice having agency and I want to practice saying yes to myself whenever and wherever I can. So one Sunday, I think it was Memorial Day weekend, I decided to look up Beyonce tickets. And I heard she was going to be in Spain. And I'm like, Spain is really close to Portugal. The tickets probably there, like the tickets to fly there, it's probably so cheap. And I looked it up and the tickets to fly to Barcelona were actually very expensive. And I was like, okay, there's just no way that I can make that work. Um, But then I looked up tickets to London just because And I saw that she only had one show left on June 4th that actually had any available tickets. The rest were all sold out. And I looked up tickets on Ryanair, like the cheapest airline (laughs) where you could literally only bring a backpack. Um, I'm serious. They won't even let you carry a purse. If you have a purse, you have to put it in your backpack. Um, So thank goodness my my purse fit inside my backpack. But they were the tickets to London were like 120 US dollars. And I'm like, you're kidding me. 120 to go to London. So that plus, of course, food, transportation, hotel and Beyonce ticket, which I thought the Beyonce ticket. I'm like, okay, well, you know, the flight's cheap. Let's see how the ticket's going to be. It's probably going to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars that I can't afford. I look at the ticket and it's only $75. And I was shook. I was shooketh. And I cannot believe I'm using that word because I hate it. But like, that's how it felt. Like I was so grateful to be, like, I just couldn't believe I told myself no to something that, to something that I wanted so freaking badly 
to something that I wanted so badly. I mean, Beyonce means a lot to millions and millions of people. Um, For me personally, dance is a huge part of my life. It is my first love. I'm a different person when I dance. I'm the freest version of myself when I dance. I absolutely love to dance. Um, If I could like redo my life over, I would 100% pursue dance professionally um, throughout my 20s. And, you know, you know, And I don't say that in a remorseful way, but just so that you get the idea of how important dance is to me. And for as long as I've known dance and as long as I've loved dance, Beyonce has always been a part of that journey. Her music has always been a part of that journey. And when I was trying really hard to get scholarships to move off the island I was raised on, I was raised on the island of Guam. It's a U.S. territory near the Philippines. Um, I entered a dance competition and one of the, well, actually, I danced to uh, several of her songs. Two of them were Upgrade and Diva. And choreographing to those songs was so easy for me. It was just so effortless to embody this confident, fearless, powerful woman, even as an 18-year-old. And I made it through audition, semifinals, and and I won the finals. And I got just a $1,000 check. But that $1,000 check symbolized to me that I could do anything, that I could get myself off the island and fulfill my dreams of going to college. And I did those things. And Beyonce was a part of that journey. So she means so, so much to me. I listened to her, all of her albums while I would study until two and three in the morning for the SAT, while I was doing SAT prep tests, while I was writing college essays and receiving rejection after rejection, scholarship essays, like you get the picture. She means a lot to me. And, um, Going to London, again, I went from this is impossible to all of a sudden I had booked a hotel, a concert ticket, a, a plane ticket, <laughs> and I was going. I And I, I started, I got went to work on Monday, and no, I went to work on Tuesday because it was Memorial Day, so we had Monday off, and so on Tuesday, I went to work, and I emailed my boss and my manager, and I said, I'm going to be in London on Friday. I, I'm leaving, and I will be missing work. <laughs> I will be missing work. I'm going to go see Beyonce. And I didn't say, is that okay? I didn't apologize, uh, you know, for taking time off. I did apologize for the last minute notice. I said, I wish I, you know, knew I was doing this sooner. Sorry about that. Um, but I, it was just so amazing to to do that and to take that leap and to fulfill a desire that I've had to see Beyonce live in concert since I was a child. And on top of this, I had, um, I've had a dream since I was nine years old to spend my twenties traveling, and that's all part of like being a dancer and you know performing around the world in different troops and stuff. Um, But I've always wanted to travel and I always wanted to do a solo trip, Um, especially since becoming a mom. I've just craved having a solo trip. But as many of you moms know, it's just so hard to do that for yourself, not just from a financial perspective and a logistics perspective, but it's really overwhelming when your kids are young to leave them for any amount of time, let alone for several days at a time. And It was just, I could never, you know, I was working with a therapist back in 2020 and she was identifying for me how important travel is to me, how much that dream that I have let go dormant because of my circumstances has brought me a tremendous amount of pain. And she told me that it's very important that I do solo travel as soon as I can and as often as I can because it's a part of me that has gone unfulfilled and that because of that lack of fulfillment, it's causing resentment towards myself and my family. And I hated that because I love my family. I love my husband and my children so much. So to feel resentment that I can't travel, quote unquote, because of them, right? I can't go on a solo trip, quote unquote, because of them. And I put in that quotes because it's like, of course I can still go on the solo trip, but we all know as moms that it's not that simple and it's not that easy to just up and get on a plane and leave your family behind and all the responsibilities and throw all that on your partner. So, you know, I I was telling her like, you're acting like I'm gonna go on a solo trip. I was telling my therapist this and like, I'm just gonna feel free. I was like, I have anxiety now. I have depression now. I have diagnosed PTSD now. I have anxiety attacks, I have panic attacks, they come out of nowhere. I'm gonna be worrying about my children while I'm in another country. I might not be able to leave my hotel room due to a panic attack, due to anxiety. I'm not gonna be able to enjoy this trip the way that I wish that I enjoyed it 
when I was in my, you know, the way that I wish that I did because I took a different life path than I anticipated for myself. And what I mean by that is my original plan for my life was to not get married in my 20s and have children, but to uh, dance and travel and be a, you know, a working performer. Um, and instead, I got married right after college. and I got pregnant right after that. And all of a sudden, in 10 months after that, I, you know, my son was 10 months old after I, you know, not 10 months after that, but when my son was 10 months old, I became a caregiver for my brother who has a serious autoimmune disease and autism. And all of a sudden, the dream of solo travel and being independent, all of that was so gone. I was buried by caregiving responsibilities and the stressors of paying bills for an entire family. Um, of course, alongside my husband, we were doing it together, but we were both drowning and it was very, very hard. And so I just was like, you know, hearing my therapist tell me that I need to to rekindle this dream, I thought that she's like, how is she, doesn't she know that even if I can financially make this happen, that I'm not going to feel light and free while I do it. So were some of those fears present when I decided to go to London? Yes, but they were significantly less so. And I think that was due to a few things. Number one, my husband's working part-time, so he was able to be more available to the kids. Number two, my kids are older and they go to school, so I knew that he would be able to get all of his work done and have the support system of our kids being at school for seven hours a day so he's not getting worn out. Um, and number three, my kids being older, right? They're not breastfeeding, they're sleeping through the night. They understand that if mommy leaves, she's coming back. So. For any of you out there who are, who have dreams and longings in your heart that maybe are hurting and causing some resentment that you feel some guilt and shame about, I just want you to know as a mother myself who has a six and four year old now that it does get better and it does get easier and there is more light at the end of the tunnel and th more things become possible for you. So if you're really in it right now with kids who are ages, four and younger or three and younger. I just want you to know that it will not be like that forever. And I just wish I had someone tell me that because I just felt like I was drowning in the in the massive weight and responsibility that is caring for, you know, children in those first three years. It is a full on 24 seven, no breaks type of situation. And it was really rough for me. Um, and I just want you to know if you're a stay-at-home mom and you're going through that right now or you're a work, working mom and you're going through that right now, um, and you know what I mean when I say working mom, working outside of the home on top of having domestic responsibilities, it's all hard and it does get better with time and with intentionality, with you really constantly practicing that awareness that is needed to delegate and set boundaries and have better communication with your partner and make sure that things are really fair in the household, but things do get better with time, with practice and with intentionality. So I'm gonna talk about the first thing that I learned, well, not the first thing that I learned, but one of the things, one of the lessons that I wanted to pass on to you, I'm gonna talk about that after the break. We'll be right back. If you've been feeling burned out, fatigued, or exhausted, or maybe all of the above, first I just want to say that this is not your fault. Society just does not set us up for success when it comes to taking care of ourselves. And secondly, <sighs> burnout sucks, and it affects every area of our lives so negatively. So what are we supposed to do about this? I've created a program called Rituals That Replenish, and the purpose of this program is to help you reconnect with what your true needs are, make space for those needs, and then practice fulfilling those needs on a regular basis. I'm a firm believer that while self-care does not solve all of our problems, it absolutely does replenish us so that we can show up for our lives and show up for the hard stuff and handle all of it from a place of strength instead of depletion. What I teach in this program, I have used for years to help me over 
overcome burnout and move through those cycles, even though I live with PTSD and depression and I have two children and I've been a caregiver and I work demanding jobs, all of the things. And it has helped me so much as well as dozens of my clients who have used the same frameworks and tips and lessons. So if this sounds like something that can help you, I encourage you to check it out on my website at miahemstad.com forward slash rituals, which I've also linked in the show notes and in the description. All right, let's get back to the show. Okay, so the first thing that I want to pass on to you that I realized as I was spending four days in London feeling, you know, I really thought I was going to feel super anxious while I was there. And all I felt was, um, not all I felt, but what I felt was a lot of relief. I felt a tremendous amount of relief. And I don't get me wrong, the first full day that I was there, like the day after um, my first like night at the hotel and I got some good rest and I was walking through Hyde Park, this beautiful, gorgeous, massive park in the middle of London. And I was thinking there was definitely a consistent hum of my thoughts saying, you need to figure out what you're going to do for Jan, my husband, when you get back. You need to like do something nice for him. You need to give him several days off. You need to find a way to, you know, find money in the budget so that he could take four days off so that he could travel somewhere new. And I was stressing about that because I know that it was really tough for even us to afford this trip to London for myself. And so I want to be clear that like, I have those thoughts. I have those feelings. I had that feeling that I needed to quote unquote, pay my husband back somehow for doing this for me. Even though he was like, I'm so happy you're doing this. I know how much this means to you. He was pushing me to do it. He was like, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it. And I don't, like I was talking myself out of it. So, you know, there was nothing, no energy from him that was making me feel like I owed him anything. You know, our relationship's not like that. And yet I still feel like that sometimes when I go and do something for myself, I feel bad. And the beautiful thing that I want to point out is that while I had these thoughts running through my mind, they were pretty quiet. Like on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the loudest, like they're paralyzing and I can't go anywhere because I'm consumed by guilt. I would say these thoughts were about a one or a two. Like they existed, but that's it. They didn't control my behavior. They didn't dampen my, damper, what's the word dampen? Dampen my joy. Like I was still able to fully function, absorb and enjoy London. And I'm so grateful for that. And I think that shows how much healing I have done and how much growth I have had. And the reason why I tell you this, for those, especially for those of you who've been with me for a long time, you know that I used to have paralyzing guilt. Like I couldn't go and get a cappuccino by myself. Like I thought if I'm going to spend $4 on a coffee, it needs to be like after church on a family day where we're all together going out getting coffee after church together. Like something, it had to be all of us together. I wasn't allowed to just spend any resources, whether it be financial or time on myself. And now here I am in London for four days to fulfill a dream I've had since I was nine years old to travel alone. And I was telling this to my friend the other day when she was asking like, how was it? And I told her, it feels like I've scratched an itch I've had for 20 years. Literally, like I had no idea how much this itch was there and how much it had been bothering me and how much pain it had been causing me until I was there walking through Hyde Park feeling like I could exhale the deepest exhale I've had in 20 years. I felt relief and joy and happiness and pride in myself for making this happen. And that is... One of the lessons I want to pass on to you, one of the insights from this trip, which is that leaving our desires unfulfilled and our dreams dormant is painful and draining. Like we get scared over how much time and energy and money it takes to plan these things for ourselves, but we don't consider how much energy, time, and resources we lose by suppressing our desires and suppressing what we really want and keeping ourselves feeling unfulfilled and, you know, forcing our dreams to be dormant when those are a part of ourselves. You know, we have needs as human beings, not just physical needs and emotional needs, but also spiritual needs. And for me, this trip was like spiritually fulfilling. And 
And it's funny because that word spiritually fulfilling, when I think of spiritual, I think of things that are like intangible. We can't see it, we can't touch it, but we can feel it. And it gives us energy and it energizes us in a way that food can't and water can't. It's that feeling, that energy that we get when we have really um, meaningful human connections like I had with Beyonce and with music. Um, And even when I told one of my good friends that I would be doing this trip, she was like, and I was going to see Beyonce, she was like, I'm sure that is going to be a spiritual experience. Like, I didn't even need to tell her that. She got it. And I know those of you listening get it. Um, And, you know, maybe it's been a really long time since you have felt spiritually energized and you have tended to those spiritual needs. But I, that's why I'm making this episode because I just want you to know that you could be unknowingly causing yourself a lot of harm and really draining yourself every day. Maybe you feel exhausted and you, you're you like, oh, I'm not sleeping well. And maybe it's bigger than that. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe you've been having big dreams of yours that have laid dormant for such a long time and you need to give yourself permission to even think about those being a possibility and think about the day that those would be fulfilled, even if that day is very far away from now. Like I said, since I was nine, I knew I wanted to go on a solo trip in Europe. Since I was nine and I'm 29 years old now and I hate revealing my age, by the way, because I feel like it makes people like doubt me or whatever, but screw that, screw hiding who we are as women. Like I'm 29 years old and for 20 years, I have wanted to do this for myself and I have finally done it. So I am so glad and I wanted to pass that first lesson on to you to please consider that if you are feeling exhausted and down that you might be suppressing a dream and a desire that you deeply, deeply have and that needs to be expressed and fulfilled. The second thing I wanted to share is that fulfilling desires can be really, really hard. And if it's hard for you, to fulfill desires. Number one, this is extremely common, extremely common, especially for women, but in particular for mothers to take time and money to fulfill our desires. Because as soon as you have children, all of a sudden our time is in relation to what, our time is in relation to our children and our money is in relation to our children. Instead of seeing $100 and thinking, oh, I have $100, I see $100 and I think about what that $100 needs to be used for in terms of my family of four. It's not just about me. And every mom on this, on this who's listening right now like gets that. It feels like a big decision every time we spend money and time on ourselves. And I want to recognize that because I feel that too. So here are some of my tips that I wanted to share with you regarding fulfilling desire and dealing with the discomfort that comes with fulfilling desire and even the guilt that could come from fulfilling fulfilling desire. Like I said, I used to have paralyzing guilt to the point where I couldn't even, I would literally go in a mind loop, a paralyzing mind loop of anxious thoughts around, okay, I really want to go get a coffee, but no, me, you shouldn't, you should wait till Sunday, but I really want to go because I'm like running kid-free errands and it would be so nice to just sit in a coffee shop by myself. No, B, you should wait until you're like doing something with the family. And like you, anyone with anxiety knows what that's like. That back and forth in your brain that wears you out. And then eventually anxiety wins and guilt wins and suppression wins. And you just go, screw this. Trying to just go do something nice for myself is so freaking exhausting that I would rather just go home and deny myself what I really want. And I lived like that for so long and I'm literally getting choked up thinking about it because it's like, God, I really put myself through so freaking much. But that is just what society had conditioned me to believe that I wasn't worth the time and money to fulfill my desires. My desires didn't matter. And so I want you to know that if you struggle with fulfilling your desires, with even knowing what they are, because you've been suppressing them and neglecting them for so long because society told you that they didn't matter, I want you to know that it is absolutely possible to get to a point in your healing and your growth journey where you not only know what your desires are, but you make a plan to fulfill them and you do fulfill them and you don't feel bad about it. Like I said, even though I was thinking on a loop for on the first day of my trip about what I was going to do for my husband when I returned to give him a break, et cetera, et cetera, eventually that voice faded to nothing. I didn't feel guilt at all. I enjoyed every moment of my trip. When I sat in the stadium waiting for Beyonce to come out and she finally came out and started singing I Care, 
and she was in the flesh singing before me, I started weeping, like full on emotions rose up from my stomach to my face and I started crying. It was such a visceral full body experience. And the girl next to me was like, are you okay? And I was like, how are you okay? But I didn't actually say that. I, I was like, yeah, and I didn't want her to get worse. I was really crying. No one else was crying. I was, in my whole section, I was pretty sure I was the only one crying. And I, I just didn't care. Like I didn't care that I was expressing every emotion I felt. I screamed in that concert. I cried in that concert. I danced in that concert. I twerked in that concert. I, it was like my little section where my chair was, was a whole freaking club. I was up in the club. People were like, are you here alone? I'm like, yes, and I'm fine with that. Like I chose myself. I didn't wait around. And I'm just like, wow, girl, <laughs> how did we get here? We are fully enjoying ourselves. And I want you to know that if me, the girl who was paralyzed by buying myself a cappuccino and spending 30 minutes at a cafe, which would have brought me so much joy, those who are close to me know that going to coffee shops brings me an inordinate amount of joy. If I can go from that to a trip to London, dedicating time and resources to myself and being so in touch with my emotions that I can finally cry, after years of being unable to cry because I've been so like abused throughout my life that I've just learned to numb my emotions. But here I am at a concert crying in front of people and I don't even care. Like, who is she? If I can do that, you can too. And here is what I recommend you do if you want to fulfill your desires freely and without guilt or shame or pain. Number one, you need to give yourself permission to start meeting your desires in the smallest of ways. Think about what your desires are, write them down, journal about them. You probably already know them. Just be real with yourself and figure out how you can honor that desire in the smallest of ways. So for me, traveling alone has always been something I have deeply desired and needed to feel most like myself. Obviously, travel is something that costs a lot of money. It takes time, time off work, it's logistics, it's planning, it's a lot. So what I would do was when I was really in the throes of practicing this years ago when my second baby was an infant. So four years ago, I would go on a weekly self-care date. I would go to a coffee shop for one to two hours. I would buy myself a cappuccino, even though it may be extremely uncomfortable. And I would sit there with my journal because a lot of dysregulation and stressful emotions would come up and I needed a place to process it. And I would just sit there and try to drink that coffee as slowly as possible while journaling about my feelings and affirming that it's safe for me to have good things, affirming that I deserve to have good things, affirming that I'm not harming anyone by having something good. And I would literally do that. It was like a process of experiential therapy, like going and doing the thing and having alone time and having something nice. So that's a way that I kind of quote unquote solo traveled in my own neighborhood, like going to a coffee shop that was only half a mile from my home because I wanted to still be close if my baby needed me. She was breastfeeding still. I didn't want to have to pump a lot before I left. So I met myself where I was at. I only went to coffee shops close by. I only spent money I could spend, which was less than $5 a week. And I brought my journal and I connected with my emotions, which leads me to my next point. You are going to get dysregulated when you do this because it's so uncomfortable to meet your desires when you haven't been fulfilling them for so long that you need to know that, that you're gonna be dysregulated, that you're gonna feel anxious, that you're gonna feel guilt, that you're gonna feel weird. And so what are you gonna do about that? For me, it was bringing journaling with me, a notebook and a pen because I needed that tool. I needed the tool to help me process my emotions. Or maybe for you, it could be when you get home, you're gonna do 10 minutes of yoga where you just lay in child's pose while you breathe and reconnect with your body because you got very like up in your head and freaking out about a lot of stuff. Or maybe you could put your AirPods in or your headphones in and listen to a guided meditation while you sit at the coffee shop or what have you. You know, whatever it is, maybe you like to draw or doodle when you feel overwhelmed. Know that you're going to get dysregulated. Have a plan. Don't be going over there and just getting your emotions all spiked and and awful. And then you're like, that was a horrible experience. Because what happens when we just allow ourselves to get dysregulated without a plan to re-regulate 
is we start to make this connection in our brain that fulfilling our desires is uncomfortable and only uncomfortable. It's a terrible feeling that makes us feel bad and it's very hard and it's not worth the discomfort. So then we just don't do it. For me, when I started to practice regulating myself and and honestly practicing mantras and affirmations, like every time a negative thought would come up, I would say, I deserve this. I deserve this. I'm worthy of this. I'm allowed to have this. I give myself permission to fulfill my desires. Or I would remind myself that if it was my husband having this time off, I would be happy for him. I would not be telling him, hey, you better feel guilty while you're gone. Like, no, I wouldn't do that to somebody I love. So don't do it to yourself. So that's my tip to you. Practice meeting your need or practice fulfilling your desires in small doses. I want you to practice or have a regulation tool with you. Figure out what you're going to do. Journal, doodle, yoga, stretching, breath work, meditation, affirmation, mantra, whatever resonates. And then I want you to show up regularly because if you make this something you only do when you feel desperate, you're not giving your brain the chance to practice building this muscle. So I had self-care Saturdays because I knew that every day, every Saturday at 10 o'clock, I was going to leave the house. Not only did that make it easier for my husband and I to plan for the kids, it helped me to not waste precious energy and time uh, negotiating with myself of whether or not I was going to do it this weekend. Because I knew it wasn't about preference. It was about healing. It was about practice. So it's not about whether I feel like doing it. It's about the fact that I know I need to show up for this regularly in order to start weeding out this guilt. And when it comes to the guilt, here's one more tip for you and then we're gonna take a quick break. You really have to identify where this guilt comes from. And you know, one of the things I coach my clients through is helping them parse through all the different places that guilt can arrive from. Did it come from religion? Did it come from your parents? Like, what do they teach you? What do they model you for you in the home? Um, Did it come from society's messaging or about what mothers should and should not do? Um, You know, where did the guilt come from? And really write that down and identify it. And then write down what that guilt is saying and who it's coming from. And then write a response. Do you really want somebody else's narrative of how you should feel about the way you live your life to be your narrative forever? Do you really want to be punished and held captive and be a prisoner to these narratives that only make you unhappy? You only get one life here. I highly, highly encourage you to take this time to identify what narratives are currently present and causing this guilt and to take the time to unravel them and write new ones. You have to do this work if you want to feel free when you do stuff for yourself, if you don't want to feel guilty anymore. This is a key component to learning how to fulfill your desires without guilt. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about something that a lot of us feel when it comes to fulfilling our desires. It's a block. It's a mindset issue. And hopefully by sharing it, you're going to be able to overcome this block and start fulfilling your desires. I'll see you right after the break. Have you ever gotten a little time to take care of yourself and then you're instantly overwhelmed with what the heck you should do first? Yeah, I used to feel that way too. I call that self-care overwhelm, which leads to decision fatigue and results in you not taking care of yourself in the way that you really need to feel nourished and filled up. This used to be a constant problem for me back when I had my second baby, and that's when I created the 4B self-care framework to help my exhausted mom brain figure out what I needed to do to take care of myself with the small pockets of time and energy that I had. In this framework, there are four types of self-care, basic, boring, brilliant, and bougie. In my new mini course, I teach you about these four types of self-care, I show you how to prioritize, and I give you a printable to plan out your self-care over a 30-day period to help you go on your own journey of self-discovery to figure out what you really need to feel healthy, happy, and taken care of. You can get this mini course completely for free on my website at miahemstad.com forward slash course. I'll have it linked in the show notes as well.
Okay, welcome back. So there is one mental obstacle. So there's three kinds of obstacles I always teach my clients about. There's mental, which has to do with your beliefs, right? Narratives, beliefs, things that you think. There's emotional, which has to do with guilt, shame, those feelings specifically and how you can overcome those. And then there are situational obstacles that have to do with your situation, whether it be financial, a lack of support, lack of resources, or even a lack of education or information about an issue. So the obstacle I wanna unpack for you right now is one of the mental obstacles that comes up a lot when people are trying to fulfill their desires, okay? This mental obstacle is the belief that fulfilling your desires takes away from the people you love. And I guarantee you deep down, you have some version of this inside of you if you struggle to fulfill your desires. You think that by being gone, you're taking away from family time. You think that by having solo time, you are taking away support from your partner and making the home completely his responsibility. You're burdening him, you're taking away support. You think that by spending money on a trip or by spending money on some clothes that you would love or by spending money on a a lunch with your girlfriends that you are taking from the family budget. You are taking money away from activities you wanna put your children in or you know some new shoes that you would like to buy for your son or whatever. Like you think that by fulfilling a part of you, a part of you, that it is damaging the people you love. This is so heartbreaking to me because what this belief basically thrives thrives off of is this idea that you're not a person too. Everybody else gets to be a person with needs and with wants, with dreams, with desires. Everyone else gets to be a person. And in their humanity, they get to have those needs and they get to have those desires. And you as the mother of the house, make sure that everybody's needs and wants are being met at all times at the expense of your own. So it's fine if you're the one being harmed, but if you do something for yourself, you think you're harming everybody else. And what I want you to do is I want you to ask yourself why you think that you're less than human. Why do you think that your desires and needs are or should be lower on the validity totem pole? Like, oh, my partner's needs and desires are valid. My children's needs and desires are valid, but mine are not valid. Mine aren't valid. They can't be valid because they're competing with the resources that I should be giving to other people. Let me tell you right now that your desires and your needs are 100% valid. And even if you desire something that nobody you know desires, you desire something that you've never heard another mom whisper that she wants to. If nobody has done or said what you want, you still have a valid desire. You don't need anyone to validate that desire for you. You exist, therefore your desires matter. You don't need to compare or to reduce the validity of it or decide that your desires are worth less than somebody else's or that they are not deserving of the same attention, treatment, resources, etc., as your children's desires or your husband's desires. I mean, yes, financially and time speaking, I was away from my kids for four days. I was away from my household responsibility for four days. I did spend money on myself. And why can't I? I work. I contribute. And even when I was a stay-at-home mom and I was not making a quote, you know, an actual paycheck, I realized after I had done the math through the help of a therapist that I was saving my family over $100,000 a year by being the the primary, um, you know, bookkeeper, house cleaner, childcare, you know, you name it. I wasn't. I was saving our family money. I deserve to have some resources allotted to me too. And so do you. You are not subhuman. Your desires are not less than. They are worthy of the same level of attention and resources as everybody else. 
And yes, that does mean that your kids and your partner make some sacrifices in order for you to have your turn. But that's the crucial key here. You should have a turn. You should always have a turn. Not once every 25 years, not every time you're only when you're burnt out, not only when you're feeling resentful and past your breaking point, but you should always get to have a turn to fulfill your desires. And you should have that turn regularly and often, just like everybody else, because you matter just as much as everybody else. And if you don't have anyone in your life reminding you of that, I am going to remind you of it every week, every day, every time you tune into this podcast, I hope hearing my voice reminds you that I am going to be in your corner telling you and reminding you that you matter, that no matter what you have been through, no matter how you have been treated, you get to decide today and from here on out that you are going to treat yourself like you matter. You are going to remind yourself of your humanity and your worth, even when past trauma tells you that you're less than human or current situations have made you feel less than human, I'm going to remind you that you are human and divine and amazing and worthy and deserving and you don't need anyone else to tell you that you deserve to have your desires fulfilled too. I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode I loved creating it and I hope you are, I just hope you're loving on yourself really well today. I woke up today not feeling good. Um, You all know that I have depression and sometimes it can take over and I just want to say I'm so grateful to be here with you talking to people who get it, who get the journey and um, if you need additional support, never hesitate to reach out. You can always find me via email. I always put my email in the show notes um, and I'll have a bunch of self-care resources on my website if you need additional support, but um, keep taking good care of yourself. Don't give up on your healing. Again, I can't believe I'm making an episode that I went, you know, about me going to Beyonce and going to London and having a solo trip and fulfilling a dream I've had for 20 years. Like, I can't believe I'm even making this episode and the fact that I am means I've come so far and... (laughs) I can't believe I've come this far. And at the same time, I can because I put in a lot of work and it's exciting because it means that if somebody like me who has, you know, gone through abuse and who has PTSD and who has depression can learn to love and respect myself in this way, I know that you can too. I absolutely believe it 100%. So I love you guys. I will see you the next time I post an episode. And in the meantime, again, don't reach, don't hesitate to reach out to me seriously over email. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you, yeah, if you need me. All right. I will see you next time. Bye.